I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Ralph Merkel, a visionary computer scientist, researcher, and leading proponent of molecular manufacturing. Ralph has been a distinguished professor at Georgia Tech and is currently a senior research fellow at the Institute for Molecular Manufacturing, in addition to being a chair emeritus at Singularity University, a director at Alcor, and co-founder of the Nanofactory Collaboration. He's also been honored to be a recipient of the 2010 IEEE Richard W. Hamming Medal for Outstanding Achievement in Computer Science, in addition to being a 2011 Fellow at the Computer Science Museum for his work on public key, public key cryptography. So, Ralph, welcome and thank you again. And uh, let's start out with cryptography. You're one of the inventors of public key cryptography and the inventor of cryptographic hashing. These have truly become fundamental enabling technologies on the internet that literally billions of people rely on every single day. So I, I just, I had to ask, how does it feel to have created something so wildly successful? And what are your thoughts on where these technologies are going? Well, obviously, it feels great to have uh, work that's uh, being used widely, and it, you know, obviously, it's going to keep being used, and it's going to be used more extensively as time goes by. As we enter more and more into the digital era, things are just going to keep getting better and better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, is, crypt is, is encryption being overused, do you think? For a couple of years now, Google has recommended that all websites use encryption, even when users aren't logged in. But it does put an additional processing load on machines, and it adds to communications overhead on the network, doesn't it? So, I, I mean, do you think that everything should be encrypted, or, or do you think it might be better in some ways if, if it was the way it used to be, where only some things were? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Basically, if you're talking about authentication, then why would you want to have strange bits that could be scrambled or modified or altered that you rely on or use? In other words, if I get bits, I would like to know that those bits have not been tampered with, and that's, that's authentication. So if I'm talking about getting bits for my own use or for business purposes or whatever, I'd like them to be authenticated. I'd like them to be perhaps digitally signed by some appropriate person or authority or whatever. If, on the other hand, we're talking about secrecy, if we're talking about preventing people from listening to those bits, some bits are actually public. In other words, if I'm using the internet to look up public information or I'm receiving information from a public authority, I want to make sure that, that information has not been tampered with, but it's public information. So keeping it secret is not an issue in that case. On the other hand, oftentimes if I'm talking with friends about private things, I'd rather it not be made publicly available and I prefer it be encrypted. And particularly in this age, we're finding out that a lot of conversations that should have been kept private, eh, maybe they're not so private. So, you know, it'd be kind of comforting if those conversations were protected by some appropriate encryption technology. So in those cases, yeah, encryption would be, a, I think, a comforting thing. So I think for bits, generally, authentication is appropriate pretty much for all bits. I don't see a real argument for saying, hey, unauthenticated bits are useful, just like I don't see an argument for picking food up off the ground if there's food that's been properly handled and properly sent, proper sanitary conditions have been followed. Uh, for encryption, well, you know, it depends on the bit. Some bits I'd, I'd like to keep encryption and um, other bits, hey, you know, if it's public, then we don't need to worry about that so much. I, I see what you're saying. Well, a related innovation of yours is the Merkle tree, which is really a fundamental part of blockchain technology and also an enabler for cryptocurrency. I, I'm wondering, could you tell me what inspired you initially to develop this? And what are your thoughts on how it's being used in blockchain now? Well, the inspiration was simple. Uh, some of you might remember the trapdoor knapsack that used to be a system that 
people thought might actually be a reasonable public key crypto system. And back in the day, I was having a hard time getting digital signatures from the trapdoor knapsack. So I thought to myself, geez, if I'm having a hard time with that, maybe I should cook up a digital signature based purely on hash functions. So in the process of developing that purely hash-based digital signature, uh, I developed Merkle trees as part and parcel of that digital signature. And that actually, that digital signature system has proven quite robust because it relies only on uh, hash functions, which is a, a very useful property. And in fact, evolved versions of that digital signature are making their way into various standards because it turns out that they are resistant to attack by quantum computers, which is a very useful property. Mm, okay, okay. Um, well, I, I wanted to ask also, because I'm, I'm kind of pushing towards cryptocurrency on a lot of these. And a part of that is just because I think that's it's so exciting and it leverages not just that, but blockchain and crypto leverages what you've developed, right, to such a great extent. Um, what are your thoughts on cryptocurrency in general? I mean, advocates claim that it'll be the future of money. Do you think that will actually happen? Um, well, it looks like it's a good idea. It looks like it solves a lot of problems. I think what's going on now, um, and you got to remember, I have not been following the, the cryptocurrency scene. I've been off doing other things. But the general observation is that cryptocurrencies seem to deal with a lot of problems. They're still going through sort of the, the teething process. There's still a lot of issues that need to be dealt with. And I'm pretty confident that the other issues will be dealt with at some point. So, you know, as we move towards a world where cryptocurrencies are widely used, I think we need to deal with a bunch of issues beyond sort of the core issues. But it's pretty obvious at this point that cryptocurrencies work. And then if you start asking me which of the cryptocurrencies are going to succeed and which fit, I don't know. That, that, that's way beyond my ability to you know, provide any sort of coherent or intelligent answers. Um, I think the other point that has to be remembered, though, is that don't focus on just the cryptocurrencies. Focus on the underlying sort of technology. The cryptocurrencies, and, and Bitcoin in particular, demonstrated that there was a technology for a technology base, which now provides uh, a successful set of capabilities that provides a distributed technology, which provides for immutable bits that are trans, it provides for transparency and operation. I just look at Bitcoin. Um, you know, it, it, you've got a bunch of bits that are distributed and transparent and immutable, and it's nonstop. It's been going for a long time, and it's rule-based. And if you want a process which operates in that fashion, and I, you know, the, the, the buzzword is a DAO, a distributed autonomous organization, uh, if you want a, a rule-based structure of that nature, then we have a demonstration that that's feasible. And that capability has a broader applicability than just cryptocurrencies. You can do a lot of things with it. If there is a problem or an issue where that kind of capability can provide utility, then that's a value. And there are a lot of issues where that kind of distributed trust is going to be useful uh, yeah, beyond yeah. Simply the cryptocurrencies. It, it, it is interesting. I, I was, I went through the boom and bust cycle and, and then I got out of it. So I'm, I'm probably in a similar place to where you are. I haven't been following it closely, but um, it, you know, one of the things that, that is interesting, actually, one of the things that I have been touching base on periodically is this Facebook Libra project. Have you been following that at all? And do you I haven't been following it? it, but the general concept of having 
a currency which is you know has dots all the i's and crosses all the t's i mean that that seems to be a good idea and then the question is you know how long is it going to take to figure out all the i's that you have to dot and all the t's you have to cross because one of the things that that we got with the existing currency is it's not always obvious what it is that it does for us because oftentimes you find out that the things it does for you you don't realize it does for you so when you're planning a new currency you have to sort of dig to figure out oh yeah it does that too uh, and and then when you develop something if you haven't realized some of the things that the existing solution provides and you don't plan for a new new solution then you know, you have to try it and fall flat on your face a couple of times before you finally figure out, oh, the reason we fell flat on our face is that the old thing solved a problem we didn't even realize we needed to solve. Oh, so, okay. Uh, that, that's one of the subtle things that you, you know, you bump into when you, you try to get shiny new technical solutions. Uh, well, you know, it's it's interesting when I was researching these questions it, and I was on your website. Actually, one of them threw me for a loop on on the crypto thing, and that was, um, and you'd mentioned this right on your web, right on the website. You've written that quantum computing will likely compromise all widely used public key crypto systems in the next couple of decades. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and but this this so this would be cryptocurrency. It would be blockchain. It could be. The, the the private transactions this would be everything that that we've talked about so far um, yeah I, I mean how how big of a, a threat do you think that might be i guess uh well it depends on how well organized people are i mean obviously if you adopt quantum resistant public key systems before someone builds a quantum computer that can break all of the existing systems then you're fine but if you blithely go along and don't prepare and you walk straight into it and someone says, hey, guys, guess what? We got a quantum computer. You're all toast. Then it, it could be a problem. So the, the name of the game is let's transition to quantum resistant systems before somebody walks in and says, hey, guys, we got a quantum computer. You're now going to play our game or we're going to you know, make problems for you. Uh, mm. And, and it, it's quite possible, I mean, for the blockchain in particular, that's all based on digital signatures. And we already have a quantum-resistant digital signature. If you go and look at what NIST is doing, they've got some candidate quantum-resistant digital signatures. And I happen to know some of them actually work and are quite reasonable because they're based on stuff I did in my PhD back in 1979. So, you know, they're, they're, they're quite good systems. So let, let me put it that way. I'm comfortable with them. And then they've got a bunch of other proposals. Um, and, you know, it, it, it comes down to, okay, we're now discussing performance. And, you know, they're, they're in the process of adopting these systems or we're, we're analyzing them now. So it will be a, a little while before we, we have the approved NIST uh, signature system, but if you want to start switching over to a quantum resistance system, you can do it. Now, uh -huh. you can certainly start planning the transition. So, you know, it just depends on how much concern you have and whether you're willing to make the transition now to one of the systems that you know works. But <clears throat> do you want to hold out for a bit and see if you can get the system with maybe better performance. Uh, that's that's the question at this point. Yeah, and so there are a bunch of traditional systems as well, different types of uh, like cryptographic links and stuff like that. I hope I'm not digging myself into a hole here because this is kind of below my my level of IT knowledge. But you know, there's like 128 bit and 256 bit encryption and stuff like that. So those are those are algorithms, right? So in theory, uh, and I, I actually on your website I saw one. I think it was called Sphinx or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. And, and so there, these quantum resistant algorithms then. That would maybe just be the same thing as switching from 128 to 256 bit encryption. You would just switch to Sphinx or one of the other algorithms that NIST is looking at. Yeah. 
And basically, NIST is in process of looking at those. Some of the algorithms have a little bit of a gotcha in that switching requires uh, a little bit more work. There's a state-based uh, signature algorithm where you have to think about what it means to store the state of the algorithm. But there's also a, a signature system that's you know, hash-based and doesn't have the state-based issues. So, you know, you, you can start thinking about those transitions now. It's probably a good idea to make sure that those transitions are underway. The problem is not so much that you can't envision and analyze the sort of the, the quantum resistance systems. The problem is once you've decided to make a transition, you have to get the quantum resistance system, you have to validate the, the system, you have to make sure it's actually resistant to quantum attack, which takes multiple years in itself. Then you have to deploy, you know, get the standards bodies to agree to it, then you have to deploy it. Each one of those actions takes years on end. Um, and if in the middle of this process anywhere someone pops up and says, hey guys, I got a quantum computer, then, you know, you're, you're kind of caught with your pants down. So you got to you got to really sort of do this well in advance. Yeah. And of course, there's there's the cost of doing it when, hey, maybe it's a long time before we get a quantum computer. But there's the risk of not doing it and someone pops up and says they got the quantum computer. So all in all, I think we should be, you know, moving at some reasonable pace towards quantum resistance systems. Uh, and I think we should do that. You know, we should do that. Because otherwise, we run a significant risk that, you know, the whole system is vulnerable. Well, yeah. And, and that's that's one of the things I'd wondered. And especially when it comes to stuff like e-commerce transactions, right, where, you know, those are becoming more and more of a part of our society. And in the case of e-commerce, I think initially that pretty much waited for HTTPS transactions. And so... So then, in a sense, if they were able to break that, or at least any kind of volume, you know, in theory, that would that would make some really sensitive financial transactions out in the open, and it would just happen all at once. Um, so that well, uh, the worst case scenario is someone breaks it and keeps it secret, and then yeah, suddenly they have access to everything and they have to tell you, and then they sort of put their thumb on the scale in a way which is invisible which is, you know, a little bit nervous making. Oh, so we, we'd like to make the transition before that happens. Yeah. Um, well, and quantum computing can also be used to generate cryptography, right? So is that a potential solution on that end? Well, quantum key distribution is something that could be used and would be presumably quite resistant to attack. On the other hand, we do have uh, more conventional methods of key distribution. If you have uh, a conventional, and I, I hesitate to say a conventional key distribution method when what I mean is public key distribution, that's you know, quite as interesting. Uh, but if you have an existing key distribution method which works and is resistant to attack by quantum computer, then that's, that's quite satisfactory. So a you know, you have to weigh the costs and the benefits of the of the quantum key distribution system. And there, there are people working on the quantum key distribution, and there are situations where it would be advantageous. And then you just say, okay, is that is that the way we want to go? Looking at the attacks that we're concerned about, is that going to help us um, prevent those attacks? And then you make the decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, I, in fact, I just read about uh, what you were talking about—the quantum key distribution. I just read an article about trying to do that using satellites, and it was a premise about the quantum internet, which I thought was kind of interesting. So, yeah, <clears throat> yep. Now the quantum computers are fun, and there are a lot of people starting to work on them. But there are a lot of people have been working on them for a while, and it's pretty clear we're going to have quantum computers and quantum algorithms. And, to do all kinds of fun stuff, and there, there are all kinds of advances being made in that area. Uh, I think it's a question of you know how fast does that get developed and how widely is it deployed. There's still a question as to you know how many things can the quantum algorithms actually do. We know there are some things quantum algorithms can do that are useful, 
and then you know how far can you go with them? I think right now the, the feeling is that quantum computers are going to be a niche application, and we'll be using general purpose computers of the old fashioned variety for most of the stuff we do, and then the quantum computer to be sort of add on processors for the handful of applications where they're really useful. But they won't be they won't be doing sort of the the general the general work that's um, sort of the meat and potatoes of the general purpose computers. That's the feeling right now. Yeah. yeah. No, it's interesting. I, in fact, um, the the Mac that I'm I'm doing this interview on has its own has its own uh, encryption chip. That's it's a it's an SOC, I guess, that they built into the board. And so, like in their case, they're offloading all the encryption to that. To you know, and so and maybe a quantum computer would be the same thing, right? Where it's just a it's just another circuit on the board, and it just functions a little bit differently. Might be. It's hard to say at this point. It is clear quantum computers do things that are useful. Uh, that you know would be of interest. Uh, in particular, they can crack the existing public key system. So you know that's of interest. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. now, so your your area of real passion from from everything I've read, and you've been going. I mean, last we we talked, I think twelve years ago now, and, and you were you were pushing into nanotech then. You were very deep into it, and you you've just been going further and further and further with it. So it, it seems like that that is an area that I definitely wanted to touch on, and. Um, I mean, you've you've expanded on this. You're, you're currently focused on nanotechnology and, and molecular manufacturing as a senior research fellow at the Institute of Molecular Manufacturing. So I, I wanted to start there by asking about the organization and your role there and, and what your focus has been with them. Well, we've been looking at a, a variety of applications of molecular manufacturing. And one of the things we've been looking at is computation. How much computation can we get in the future? And if you look at the future of computing, it's pretty clear we're going to have a spectacular amount of computational power. Take, for example, the concept of a molecular mechanical computer. Now, you might think that Babbage is so very 19th century, but the concept of a mechanical computer, if you scale it down, really is one that's quite attractive because at the smaller scales, things move faster. And the other thing that's quite interesting at small scales is energy dissipation goes down. So we've developed a concept for a molecular mechanical computer. And by the way, you can Google molecular mechanical computing and you can find the the various papers we've been publishing on this. But the concept is fairly simple. If you have a computer which is molecular in scale, and if you define the actions of that computer, how do I put it? If the only thing that is moving is rods that are connected to each other by rotary joints, so that the only energy dissipative element is rotation around the rotary joints, then the energy dissipation of the computer is very small and you're looking at you know another 10 or 12 orders of magnitude decrease in energy dissipation as compared with the existing computational models so anyone who tells you that Moore's law has come to an end is kind of unaware of the opportunities that are ahead hmm. so essentially what what we're saying is that um, Moore's law, at least the generalization of Moore's law to the power of computing, is going to continue. Now, there might be some little hiccups along the way as we transition from one technology to another, but you have to keep in mind we've gone from relays to vacuum tubes to integrated circuits to large scale integrated circuits. And if we make another transition to some form of molecular computing, that's just another technology as we continue this progression uh, along an exponential path towards ever more powerful computers. And at this point in time, the big limiting factor in increasing computational power seems to be heat. So designing a computer, a molecular mechanical computer, that's really good at keeping 
energy dissipation per logic operation as small as possible. Seemed like the appropriate thing to do, which is what we did. Yeah. Well, in addition to so in addition to molecular computing, you're also working on like the nanofactory collaboration. I wanted to ask about that as well, which has the goal of of creating and it looks like you've already got prototypes built, desktop manufacturing systems that are creating diamondoid products. And and so I, I'm guessing that's basically just kind of um I don't know what you'd call it, almost like vapor depth carbon deposition, but you know, so you're laying down carbon atoms, right, to make diamondoid products with that. Well, basically, we're looking at the theoretical aspects of building molecular uh, devices. Obviously, if you're talking about molecular computers, the question that arises how do you build molecular computers? <clears throat> and one of the things we're looking at is well, if you want to build a molecular computer, how would you go about doing it? And there are a variety of answers. Uh, today's existing technologies for building molecular computers are in their infancy. But if you look at the kind of advances that are being made, you find that we're moving forward. And in you know 10 or 20 years or some time frame like that, we can reasonably anticipate that we'll have the core technologies that will let us build a variety of molecular devices and to do them with the precision that's necessary to start building molecular machines. And then once you can build molecular machines, you can build molecular machines that can build more molecular machines. And then you're off to the races. So then that, that allows you to build a variety of devices. And in particular, there are devices that would let you build molecular medical robots that would then allow you to improve your health. So there's a, a whole line of research that says, you know, if we had medical nano devices that were very small and would float in your circulatory system, they could do useful things. Let's put it this way. Disease and ill health are caused by damage at the molecular and cellular level, but today's tools are simply too big to deal with those problems. Mm. In the future, if you have tools that are of an appropriate size and of appropriate precision, then you could deal with the fundamental causes of disease and health, and you could cure and heal in cases that today would be considered simply hopeless. So that would put medicine on a whole new plane of capabilities. And that so would give us longer and healthy lives. It, it, it sounds like then a lot of this research, because I know, well, from what I followed, I guess, um, nanotech has been held up by the lack of assemblers for a couple of decades now. It sounds like your research is kind of trying to sidestep that as much as possible, right? To try and develop these devices using different processes. And then I, I think, as you mentioned, we'll, we'll have assemblers hopefully in the next couple of decades or so, do you think? Well, I think the, the focus is more on a nano factor. In other words, a system capable of manufacturing products that are atomically precise. And the nano factory, you know, the nano factory is focused more on the overall manufacturing process. I think the assembler was uh, an, an early approach towards these concepts, but it was, uh, it, it's a concept that, you know, I think, gave people the EVGs. So, eh, okay, let's let's have a different model which doesn't make people feel nervous and then we can roll forward. And I think the nanofactory concept is a concept that looks more like a box that manufactures atomically precise products and is based more on the concept of convergent assembly. Convergent assembly is a concept that Small parts can be assembled into larger parts. Larger parts can be assembled into yet larger parts. And each stage of the assembly process, you have an appropriate system that can take components of that size <clears throat> and put them together into the larger parts. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I did a paper on this some years ago, did a scaling study of the issues involved. And it turns out you can go from molecular scale parts up to you know, meter scale parts fairly rapidly looking at a matter of 
few hours, something like that, from molecular scale inputs through a series of stages up to meter scale outputs. And that process of convergent assembly looks like something that we could use in a nanofactory to build you know, macro scale products where the macro scale products were atomically precise. Whether that macro scale product is a computer or whether it's some other macro scale atomically precise product, it's, you know, pick your product and build it. Uh, yeah. atom atomically precise products are quite useful. You can have very strong materials. For example, if I had a strut that was built out of diamond, then the strength to weight ratio of diamond is, you know, over 50 times that of steel. Um, and this becomes very important if you're talking about, well, to the aerospace industry, they, they become very concerned about strength to weight ratio, particularly if you're talking about a rocket launch or a shuttle launch or something of that nature. If you can improve the strength to weight ratio of the shuttle or the materials in the shuttle by a factor of 50, especially if you can then drop the manufacturing cost, then you can reduce the cost below Earth orbit by a factor of a thousand or ten thousand. And there was a PhD thesis done um, a few years ago that basically ran through the various launch systems. And you know, you can look at the shuttle, or you can look at the Saturn V, or you can look at other launch systems. And the conclusion is pretty similar across the board. If you can build light, strong materials at a lower manufacturing cost. You get, you know, fact three or four is a magnitude reduction in cost to low Earth orbit mm. using the existing launch systems. So that's that's an area where it's pretty clear that if you could build a nanofactor, then you would have great improvements because you go from, you know, high launch cost to low launch costs, and then developing such a system would be a very valuable objective. <laughs> So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now, so you're, you're also working with, uh, let me see. Uh, sorry about that. I, I can edit this by the way. <laughs> you're also the chair emeritus at, at, for nanotechnology at Singularity University. Uh -huh. Is, is, is that more on the computing side of things or, or is that more, I mean, cause you were just talking about materials. So, that's all over the board. I mean, Singularity University is interested in the future of everything. So I'm a component of that because I'm interested in the future of, you know, molecular manufacturing and medicine and uh, computing and, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And then obviously Singularity University wants to know where is the future of the Internet and where is the future of you name it. Uh, 3D printing, or you know what's going to be happening next year, and the year after, and five years out, and ten years out, and the whole bit. So I think there are a lot of things. Uh, Singularity University all, also looks at the challenges facing the world. I mean, the UN keeps a list of sort of major challenges, and I think a number of other organizations keep lists of major challenges. There's water, for example. How do we provide water? to the, the world. And it, this, it's a non-trivial problem. There are a lot of places where clean, potable water is an issue, and how do you provide that? Oh, and by the way, nanofactories will solve that problem as well, because if you have a membrane which is very thin and has pores in it that pass water and don't pass contaminants, then suddenly you have an ability to purify water at a large scale. And if you have a nanofactory that can produce something which is a filtration device which allows seawater or some other source of impure water to enter at one side and pure water to pour out of one port and, you know, contaminated water to pour out of another port, then now suddenly you have an ability to... Uh, provide pure water at low cost because the filtration mechanism, if you have atomically precise filtration, can be very good. And you now have an ability to carry that out in a way which is much better than the existing filtration systems. Mm. So that's another area where you have uh, a, a great ability. 
Well, I, now I wanted to ask about your thoughts on the singularity itself. And, and uh, I, well, just as a prognostication thing, because I think that we're all probably guessing to some degree, but are, are, would you say that you're yay on it or nay on it? And then I guess, what do you think the threat or danger level might be? Well, uh, look, just take Moore's law and take the statement that I made that, you know, we get 10 or 12 orders of magnitude more at least, and then just draw out the, the, the straight lines that are on semi-log paper for Moore's law, draw them out another 12 orders of magnitude, and then ask yourself, okay, if we've got computers that are, you know, 10 or 12 orders of magnitude more powerful than what we've got, what does that do in terms of where we are and I'm not even going into the, you know, ooh, where's the software going? How are we doing in terms of developing the, the capabilities of, you know, neural nets or, or deep learning or whatever? I'm just pointing out that we're going to have a lot more hardware capability. And we're going to have it on a schedule which is roughly the anticipated one if you kind of draw the straight lines on some of them paper. So we're coming up to a lot of computing power and all of the, the folks who are running around talking about deep learning say that's gonna keep going. And then where does that put us? And that, you know, if you want to call that a singularity, then okay, then that's a singularity. Um, and where do where does that put us, you know, good old biological humans, well, I kind of like to be in a situation where we have these very smart computers providing us with, you know, intelligent guidance as to what it is we can do and helping us along the way if we can structure it that way. And then there's a lot of debate as to whether we can structure it that way. I'd like to think we can. So, so now, would, would you say would you tend to be in favor of these? I, I guess I'll probably close with that one, but because there's, I know there's the like the Elon Musk camp who's terrified of AI and the singularity, and then Ray Kurzweil. I tend to be more on the Kurzweil side myself, where people are bracing it. Where do you think that you would you would fall on that scale? I guess. Well, it's coming. I mean, what you're going to announce that people aren't going to build more powerful computers? What? How do you turn this process off? You go to Intel and say, stop building more powerful computers? Maybe you go to Samsung and say, Samsung, you're, you're building more powerful components for computers. Stop doing that. NVIDIA, you stop doing it. What? We're, we're going to tell other nations on the planet that they should stop building more powerful computers stop being competitive. Maybe we go to Chinese and say, hey, you guys, stop stop building computers. You know? We want you to slow down. Uh, I, I think I think we're on the roller coaster and it's moving and it's it's gonna carry us forward. So I think at this point we need to figure out how to sort of guide the process and move in a direction which is going to be sensible. And I think we can do that. Uh, so I think that's what we need to do. So I think all of this talk about, well, you know, we can, we shouldn't do it or should, it, it, the decision has been made. We're, we're going to do it. And then the question is, how do we do it in a way that makes the most sense for humanity? And what is that way? How, how do we make the most beneficial use of this technology, which we are heading for at high speed? Um, and, you know, I think that, that's basically what Ray is saying is, hey, we're, we're heading towards the technology. Let's figure out how to benefit from it. And are there risks? Sure, there are risks on any new technology. Let's think about that, figure out how to deal with them, and move in a way which avoids the risks and gains the benefits. That's sort of the thing we always do. I mean, come on, fire. Fire is a risky technology. Fire can burn down whole villages. Fire is not something you want to you know, deal with without understanding the risks, but we have understood the risks of fire. We have fire stations, we have fire extinguishers, 
we've developed a whole set of technologies for dealing with the risks of fire. So that's what we need to do is we now have a new technology and we need to understand the risks, we need to understand the benefits, and we need to think about it and plan, and learn how to deal with the risks effectively and how to gain the benefits. It's, it's not going away. Yes. Well, Ralph, thank you. Thank you so much. That that was all of the questions I had. Well, actually, I do I do have one more if you're open to it. I, I wanted to ask what's coming next, what your project and your plans and your vision is for the future. Well, stay happy and keep things rolling. We're going to have a very interesting future. Uh, I think one of the things that I find very interesting is that right now we are, how do I put it? Governance is, I think, the single most important issue. I think everyone will agree that the governance that we see in the world today is perhaps not as good as we might hope. So that raises the question, how do we have governance of nations, of large organizations? How do we have governance that is of higher quality. And that gets into what I've been calling Dow democracies. Uh, and there, there are various people who are getting interested in this. And that's uh, an interesting question. Uh, I wrote a paper on it. Uh, you said these were Dow democracies? Dow democracy, D-A-O democracy. So ah. You can Google it. And I wrote a paper which sort of suggests some ideas as to how you might approach it. And the basic concept is everyone runs around and says, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the rest. And then sort of if you take that statement and say, well, wait a minute, what about developing something which is better than democracy, taking advantage of everything we've learned over you know, the past century or two? and actually does maintain the benefits of democracy and also takes into account things we've learned about the wisdom of crowds and the aggregation of knowledge and things of that nature tries to pull them all together and says how do we create a governance process which benefits humanity and tries to pull together the best solution rather than falling to the least common denominator. And there's some interesting ideas there. and Hopefully some of those ideas will sort of blossom and prove useful in the future in terms of how we actually organize ourselves into groups and societies and make decisions. And right now our, our collective decision-making processes are you know, not optimal. 